Perfect. All right. Well, hello, everybody. There's lots of new folks today. So I, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And uh, we're welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Let me share screen. Here we go. So this is our weekly uh, community conversation um, on everyday brain life stuff. Um, and so, um, and, and, and for those of you who've not joined us before, um, we every month have a different theme of what we talk about. And so this month's theme is neurodiversity and culture. Sarah, are you getting those participation pop-ups? Yeah, and I'm saying admit all, admit, admit all, and I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, I don't know why it's not letting Sierra in. Yeah, somehow. I've hit I've hit admit twice now. Okay, all right. It's 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 uh I'm sure I'm sure we'll figure it out. Anyway, <laughs> I'm back in. Oh, fantastic, guys, Sierra. So um, if you'd like closed captioning uh, for tonight's program, if uh, depending on what version of Zoom you have, um, you'll either see live transcript CC or the more dot, dot, dot. And from there, you can choose show subtitles. And you can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you change your mind. So um, we're gonna, gonna go over some, some ground rules. Uh, because last month at Brain Club, when our theme was about creating neuroinclusive spaces, um, ground rules were an important theme that came up all month long. The idea of knowing your access needs, where access needs are defined as anything you need to have full and meaningful participation in an experience, and to know or at least respect everyone else's access needs, although it's hard to respect an access need that you don't know about. So we create a space where it is normalized to talk about what we need in, in, uh, in a space. And related to that, there is no right way to participate. Um, and what that means is that you can participate um, uh, with spoken speech, you can participate in the chat box, you can participate by observing. Um, uh, so, sometimes folks uh, chime in, oh, sorry, I'm not participating, I'm cooking dinner. Well, you are participating because you are here. Um, so there's no right way to participate. And um, uh, I, I, as it comes to access needs, for many people saying that explicitly upfront is an access need. So like Luna, my five-year-old, um, sometimes she'll resist going to a thing. Um, I'm not going. And I'll say, Luna, there's no right way to participate, remember? This is a place where like, there's no right way. And she says, oh, now I'll go. So anyway, the, attitud the attitudinal norm is an access need for many people. That's why we include it. And of course, because we're all gonna have different brains, we're gonna have different access needs and sort of acknowledging that and acknowledging that um, uh, sometimes those access needs are going to conflict and that's inevitable. And so having a plan for course correction is, is okay. So we'll, we'll proceed through that. So that was a slide from last week. So anyway, um, the last thing that I'll mention is that um, a word on language. So tonight you'll hear me and maybe other participants using identity first language as it relates to neurodivergence. I am autistic and for me that is part of my identity. That is not the case for all autistic people um, but it is the case for me and, 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 and many, many, many of our participants. And so um, sometimes when identity first language is new um, it can sometimes be like ooh that's new. So that's the idea, is the idea that for many people, um, language reflects paradigm, the way that we're seeing the world. And um, when we do not need to necessarily separate um, um, things from our identity, that comes out in language. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll hear that play out tonight. 
Um, as I said, all forms of participation is okay and all forms of communication are okay. You know, um, in, in addition to, as I described before, chat box, unmuting and, and, and shouting it out, um, you know, using emoticons, reactions, mixing, matching, whatever, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and uh, safety, safety comes first. And so um, affirming all aspects of identity. And as I said before, respecting and protecting access needs. And so um, be, another slide from last week, um, we talked about how a safe space requires that a shared goal of not only meeting our own access needs, but not violating others access needs. And so um, uh, the last the last uh, part of ground rules that I'll, I'll cover, because um, uh, sometimes this term is, is unfamiliar, is that of a content warning. A content warning is an important part of neuroinclusive safe space. You're welcome to share your truth, whatever you feel safe talking about. But just keep in mind, if there's something you're talking about that you personally experienced as distressing or traumatic, please let others know about it first by announcing the name of the topic. Let's call that a content warning. And, and try to keep those topics uh, with content warnings as brief as possible so that um, participants um, who, um, you know, they, they can listen with informed consent or they can turn their sound off or leave the room for a minute or two. Um, and we'll, we'll type in the chat box with content warning over. Um, and um, we, we may need to redirect the topic of conversation to protect others' access needs. Okay, we're gonna start. All right, so neurodiversity and culture. Um, a few months ago, we had a whole theme, a whole monthly theme talking about the double empathy problem. So you remember that, um, you may remember that. <laughs> um, I don't know what you remember. Um, where it's not that there is one correct type of social skills, communication skills, but it's about um, miscommunication being the result of a mismatch of worldview or a mismatch of communication styles. And um, in, in, uh, in British July, we took on the theme all month of bridging the double empathy problem um, in, in with, uh, relationships, education, healthcare, employment, um, just about seeking to understand other perspectives. And um, I think this is the, the, the natural progression of that. Um, because when we think about culture, we're really talking about the customs of a group of people. They're the norms of social interaction, behavior, communication, attitudes. And whenever we are um, uh, encountering someone who belongs to um, a culture different from ours, sometimes those norms may be different from ours. And it's not a big deal. We celebrate that. We celebrate that diversity and we seek to understand it. And um, we, 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 that, that, that works out. And for lots of people, neurodivergence, um, that is the way that, um, you know, that one's brain is wired um, uh, to think, learn, and or communicate is actually a culture. And, and often it's not talked of in that way. Sometimes, um, lots of times in fact, um, the message is given either explicitly or implicitly that there is one correct way to socialize, one correct way to behave, communicate, when really it may be an issue of culture. So um, I, I, I shared last week, I'm gonna keep using this slide because I love it so much. Um, I, I used this slide from a, a training I gave to some therapists a few weeks ago about neurocultural competence. And I said, hey, Luna, she's five. Luna, what should, I'm doing another neurocultural competency training. What should I tell the people? And this is what she said. Um, she said, mama, tell them there's no right way to be a person. As she sits there in her mermaid sparkle dress, eating chicken off a stick. Um, yes, yes, Luna, there's no right way to be a person. So I thought about any number of ways that we could have taken tonight's brain club. Um, and I thought about like getting really specific about some of the cultural trends in many, not all, but many neurodivergent communities. 
Um, but then I remembered the long game. At ABB, we often talk about the long game and often throw a hashtag behind it and post it everywhere. Um, we really want to think about that of inclusion, right? Like creating spaces for people with all type of brains to belong. And so, you know, I really want to be moving away from an us versus them paradigm, right? And really just promoting safety and connection for all people. Because I think Luna says it best. There's no right way to do most things. And so since connection is the pathway to health and we want everyone to be as healthy as possible, remembering that there's like any, any time there's like a default um, behavior, a default way of communicating, a default way of like being in the world, the default way of writing an email, a default way of like attending a Zoom meeting, like that's not going to make all people with all types of brains feel safe and connected and therefore it's not healthy. So um, I think that um, with that introduction, I'm gonna play a video. Um, actually, what I'll, what I'll say first is that um, uh, for, so, some of you have been, you know, we started Brain Club back in January, and when uh, when we when you know the format has evolved like a like a lot over time. Um, but I, I I'd, I'd say lately we're getting into because I, I think you know when something loses novelty we change it up. So lately the ABB staff. Um, when we find ourselves having an interesting conversation at a meeting, we're like, oh, this should be a brain club and we record it. And like, we're, anyway, so, so we're going to do another short video clip. So, so this is a conversation Sarah and I had, let so, us, uh, so Sarah Wilkins, our community programs coordinator. Hi, Sarah. Um, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play our casual conversation. And this video is, a, um, I was going to say it's about, no, it's exactly nine and a half minutes. I know because I just made the video five seconds ago. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so, so while this is going, um, feel free to um, uh, keep, keep the chat box going. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Um, but, but we can start the conversation now in the chat box. All right, here we go. I never remember the motor plan of getting out of this box in time. Here we go. So you were saying something about not feeling alone. Yeah, I feel like um, that is something that comes up a lot with uh, the ABB community as feeling like um, people have found their tribe and feeling less alone in their journey, whether it's as a parent or as an individual, um, it, connecting people with one another and making people feel less alone. Yeah, like I think that connection is the path to health no one tells you that though and so like when you're in it and you're alone you don't know that the reason you feel so terrible one of the reasons you feel so terrible actually you know what if i i have to unhide self view show self view okay because then it can be like a conversation sure. so like when you're in it when you feel terrible and you don't know why you feel terrible and if you're going to make a list of all the things about why you feel terrible being alone might not even be like on that list because yeah. no one tells you that connection is part of health it's in fact like <laughs> the the important path to health right right and with the the um neural pathways in our brain dating back to many many years ago there's a huge part of our brain that still functions in that need to belong and you know if you didn't have that back in tribal times then you know you could not survive you know um yeah. and so i think you know having community um is is it's a deep wired part of our brain to need to belong yes and, um 
And when we don't have that, there's a part of us that um, feels like it's, you know, uh, just super isolating. And, you know, um, and, and I think people just need that for safety. They need to feel that sense of belonging and community. And I, I think that's what people find when they come to All Brains Belong. Today, I attended a virtual talk from, uh, by my professional idol, Dr. Virginia Spielman, who's the executive director of the Star Institute for Sensory yeah. Processing. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Spielman um, uh, uh, had the most like, I mean, anytime I hear her speak, I'm just like, everything you say is gold. Um, but what, uh, some of the things she said were, uh, were things like, self needs other in order to become wow and thing. and she talked about like self actualization part of that is communal actualization it's like part of the development of personhood yeah and um she talked about skills for the job of living and the skills for the job of living are doing, being, becoming, and belonging. Wow. Because, I mean, this is how people lived for so many years in hunter-gatherer societies, right? Like, I've, I've heard uh, Dr. Gabor Matei say that, you know, this the ideal environment for a child to grow up in is a hunter-gatherer society. That's what the research shows. Totally. Because being around the community, having aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and um, and neighbors and friends and, you know, having that community around, um, you know, around a family provides, um, well, less stress, you know, on, on all the responsibility falling on the parents, for example, if it's, if it's parents with children. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just the way that we're wired to be is to live in community and, and cooperate with each other to each have different roles that we play. And, you know, that idea of interdependence, um, it really, it's, it, it really is a primal need really to be interdependent. And this myth that we live in, you know, a world where we're supposed to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and live in an individualistic way is, is really toxic. And it's totally a toxic. Kind of, you know, just a, a world that, you know, ABB is, um, providing a space that is much more in tune with um, sort of where people started with communities and bartering and sharing and, you know, taking care of one another. Totally. And I also think that in societies where groups were collective, like all doing the thing together, like, that's that's also missing so you don't like go to a group of autistic people you like like because you're not doing anything so you're not becoming you're not collecting you're just like sitting there like just like anyway so the idea of that you would meet someone through your shared interests and like do the thing the thing might be talking about a thing that you care about but you're still doing the thing doing it together with other people who are you know interested in that thing mm -hmm. um you know it's not just like oh it, you know put a bunch of random people together and form friendships like that's not right. that's not how it works right and and so like a lot of times you know they'll be like social skills groups or like something like that um which are often you know like t giving the implicit message that like you don't have any social skills because there's one right way to have social skills and you don't have it so like there's that but it's also like not how people make friends yeah so it's uh so I, I i think back to um when when anna house presented at brain club and was talking about like okay so like where do you meet friends like how do you even get started and it's like you have to figure out you have to first actually figure out what you love yeah so like then you can find people who love what you love but if you don't even know what you love because you're so dysregulated like it all just and, and then i connect that to like 
the Hannah Bloom Brain Club two weeks ago, where it's like, okay, well, um, we were here. We were thinking about like how as parents, you know, do we signal safety within like the culture of our households? And like what came out of that, I was like, as an adult, I am so rarely regulated. And Hannah was like, I think she was surprised to hear me say that. I was like, no, no, I am so rarely regulated. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you like have to be regulated in order to know what you love, in order to then do the thing you love and be connected with people who love what you love. And you're not regulated if you're not connected. It's like this vicious cycle. It is. So, so at least to come and connect as the path to health and regulation like that might that that's like another starting place of like all right well let's talk about the journey let's talk about regulation let's talk about these things that you know they're relevant to my life at least start there and then you can differentiate based on your interests once you become regulated enough to even engage in your interests Yeah. Yeah. I think like you talked about, you know, people have to feel safe and they have to feel that sense of community to even access that part. Because I think a lot of people, they're just, you know, they're burnt out by life. And so they maybe aren't in tune with what brings them joy. And so being in an environment that um, talks about access needs, not just for some people, but for everybody, that everybody has access needs. And so um, normalizing that and allowing people to discuss, you know, openly, like what um, their access needs are. I mean, that's something that a lot of people have talked about with ABB that um, they never had, you know, had, they didn't have language for that before. Right. They didn't know what that they didn't. Yeah, they just didn't. And they didn't consider that they maybe had access needs or that other people might as well. And um, just having coming to ABB and having the language for what their experience has been up until that point, which you know, for some people, it's, you know, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you've not had language to go with some of the feelings you've experienced throughout your life, you know, and so having language to put to that is the first step and feeling safe and having community. And then I think you can get to like, well, what, you know, what, what are we passionate about? What, you know, what, what can we connect on with other people? Any thoughts? Is this resonating with anyone? I was just about to type in the chat and then I'm so happy that I don't have to type in the chat and can talk because I hate typing. But I was I'm just... so glad that you shared your access needs. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm so happy to talk, but I'm not going to show my face because I'm in my PJs and my dog is being crazy. Anyways, the I wanted to just say like yes to that idea that access or that vocabulary um, and language is so key to being able to create community because it's so key to be able to express ourselves and to act, be able to articulate the emotions that we feel on top of the experience we're lived. So I just wanted to say yes to that. Uh, ABB's taught me so much language and vocabulary and uh, just ways to think about the same, the, the problems. So yes, I just want to say yes to that. Yes to the vocabulary. Yes to the language. Thank you for that. That's amazing. Right. You know, like I, I didn't have a language for this for like almost all of my life. Right. So just, and, and, and I, I, I think I, you know, I was having this conversation, not about neurodiversity and access, um, but about a different topic, but like the analogy I think will be apt is um, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was telling my husband, I said, you know, I, I think that little kids, um, when, when, a, when a narrative is not provided for someone's experience, they tell themselves, we tell, we told ourselves um, a narrative to fill in the gaps. And almost always the narrative that a little kid comes up with is I'm broken, I'm defective, it's my fault. Um, and I think that like, you know, as, as, as an adult, like unlearning the narrative of like, there is a correct way to do the things and it's not me, um, like that, 
that that is that is real. And you know, I I really I really want all the young kids, you know, my five year old, all my little kid patients to grow up like actually thinking that there's not a def- like a default way to be a human. I and mean, it's really like it, it's it's all okay. I mean, I think what we're bumping into is just feeling like this world is made of systems and the systems are not designed to accept our child or even interested in truly understanding like what his access needs are. And it's demoralizing, I guess. I don't know what the right word is, like frustrating, you know, like wanting the the culture to be there and feeling like, yes, we are. Um, you know, I just, I guess like maybe we just, if we think of ourselves more as like pioneers, um, (laughs) because nobody's done this before and hopefully in a hundred years, we'll look back and be like, yeah, those folks that were like on the forefront of increasing access and just changing the way that neurodiversity is talked about and thought about, like that's, you know, they were on the right track. So I don't know. I just... Sometimes I think it's just hard to even crack into this, uh, you know, to crack into anything, like, uh, because it's really just not designed for people that don't fit neatly in that little box. So my two cents. Totally. Thank you for naming that thing. And I'm so glad you're here, Stacey. You know, I, I think that, I mean, like so many people have said that exact thing at Brain Club before. And if you don't name the thing and then have someone else be like, me too, then you don't, you think you're the only one like dealing with, with, with these dysfunctional systems. Um, it's a, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a, like of all of the many layers of privilege that I, I have, like one of them is that I actually am, I spend more of my day around people who get it than people who don't anymore. That was not the case a year ago. Um, and so it's, it, I, 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 I think it's about, like, you know, anytime I have these conversations with even people who never, like not, not the people who come to Brain Club, but like people who've never thought about this before and like aren't living this, and this isn't relevant. But anytime I like name the thing, people are like, oh, I never thought about that. Like nobody's like, oh, well, that's nonsense. Like they just really... I think never thought about it. So, I mean, yeah. Um, reading the chat, what has changed for you now that you're around people who get it? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Let me think about that. I would say I am, I guess I'm more able to discern safe versus not safe. That's like the single biggest difference. Like in a world where everything is pathologizing and everything is um, not me and everything is like, this is the way it is. Now, when I'm spending most of my day in a different paradigm, um, when I encounter you know, the, the outdated concept of, you know, there's, there's normal brains and everyone else. Um, I, it stands out as like, oh, that's that paradigm. And I get a limbic response and I notice it. And I, you know, depends on what role I'm in. Like if I'm like doing a training, if I'm like, you know, trying to accomplish some long game, you know, then I cortically overread my limbic system and, you know, all that. But like, if I'm wearing mama bear hat, I leave. I actually leave. That's what's different. Because I know that that's it. I have a choice when you think that all the environments make you feel bad about yourself and make your make you feel bad about your child make your child child feel bad about yourself like when you think that's all there is you would maybe think you got to suck it up or like comply with it or whatever but 
it's it's more like that's not how I felt yesterday at this other environment. That's what I think's different. Because I didn't know it was possible. I like wanted to imagine something was different, like that something different would be possible, but I really, I really had no idea. It was like the ultimate experiment of like quitting my job and starting a nonprofit and do, 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 you know, like all that. <laughs> the ultimate experiment. I wonder, you know, because I think that for, 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 hi, Amy. <laughs> Hello. Um, and uh, I guess I'll stick with, I'll, I'll speak and I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, but uh, this was bringing up a couple of things for me as, uh, as people were talking, but um, are you familiar with the Lakota Circle of Courage? Um, for some reason, your sound is gone. Let me do something. Here. No, 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 no. I was, I was still muted. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, oh, okay. I only, only <laughs> I very okay. recently learned about this. I'm doing a Lend Fellowship, and that actually came up in my, in my, in my course two weeks ago. But I, yeah. But say more. Say more. Well, it was just um, it, the ideas of, uh, and we, we tried to do this at Lairway, even though there were like the pressures above to be properly documenting stuff in like an ABA style or what have you. But we really focused on. Uh, the, and I'm totally forgetting one of them, I think, but it's belonging, generosity, um, mastery, and then I think autonomy is the fourth one. Well, but the problem the is the other one's components of the human experience. Independence. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Is, yeah, I think overly but, so, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, the other piece about the Lakotas that was very interesting is they did a, uh, they had an official ceremony basically forgiving the colonizers and inviting colonize the, the descendants of colonizers to start learning about their culture. And one of the concepts that I thought is very fascinating is their belief of the child is always right in their approach to upbringing children. Um, the two parallel thoughts I'm having, because I'm a dual processor too. <laughs> it's almost like what you're doing here, what ABB is doing is unpacking some old damage that's been done uh, as far as like old truths that we used to know and live by that got taken away, both mostly through colonization. But the other thing as a, as a moment of being a, a history dork, um, uh, witch hunts. The original witch hunt was an attack in Scotland, the first one that was really documented. It was an attack on a, a local healer and midwife that had a lot of power in the community. And it was more about the church and Western medicine coming in and trying to, and taking that power away from the women that, that were healers, that were parts of the community and very accessible to their communities. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, that that's is, all I'm going to say, but there's, there's two so <laughs> much that's really interesting about that. You know, I think that learning, you know, like, you know, if you can zoom out and, and you know, I, just, I remember being a little kid and being taught the theme that history repeats itself and like having, having a, you know, the, the, the predictability in many ways of, you know, for good or for, for really not good, um, of, of kind of the predictable aspects of human behavior, learning from, you know, like, it, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, your example of the circle of CODA as a model, like such a powerful model of like, of, 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 of what, what works about believing in 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 the wisdom of children like yeah that that is that is the key to the universe and you know to be able to learn from 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 all kinds of cultures that i don't belong to that have really important messages and and models that can be a applied to all kinds of things. That's the whole point, I think, about being curious about, and, 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 and like, it's so clear that there's not one norm. Um, and I think to your, to your second point about like, yeah, it's a, 
It's um when we talk we talk about this at Brain Club uh, quite quite a bit um about like when when you when when someone tells someone that they're wrong that they have brain rules that they have to change what they're doing because the way they're doing it's not right um it's completely a predictable thing that there's going to be this limbic response no one necessarily talks about it in terms of brain science but like yeah um so which is which is why I think that it's 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 we we try to not be saying like hey systems you know you're you're doing it wrong but like this is really just about you know oh great we've learned new things we've learned you know the neurodiversity paradigm and the big scheme of things is is relatively new we've always had different brains now we have language for it um, and when we really if you know I, I think in a in a community that is motivated toward the pursuit of inclusion. Um, how could it not involve, you know, paying attention to neurodiversity and access, as opposed to like, you know, changing the system, blah, Mia, thanks for your patience, sorry, I didn't see your hand, in, you're, you're in my yeah. periphery, so I didn't see you, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I actually have found that in principle, I think that a, a lot of me has always believed that, okay, these people are in the wrong, but it's like, it felt, feels like, well, but they have more power over me because they can, they can, because they could, uh, these systems could abuse me or deny me access to things. It's like that, uh, that was very, very much my sort of um it's like even if even if we do believe even if I did recognize that they were wrong, it's like but they could overpower me anyway, sort of thing. Yeah, and I think that um you, you, I don't know the best the best way of saying this. I think that it's about it's so hard. Like all of this is so hard, and I think all 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 we can do. I'm just seeing Sarah's comment in the chat. You know, I think that just just as as connecting with other people who get it, I think is is, you know, not just from a, you know, a shame reduction or like a, a reality checking standpoint, but it's like, uh, ho hopefully it, it actually sh strengthens your, your resolve to, you know, to, 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 to again, dis discern what environments to move toward. Um, and, and again, there's like so much there's so much, you know, the intersectional layers of, of privilege versus oppression that play into that. And there's not, there's not a right answer. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's sometimes when I think about like, like sometimes people like adults share the story, like stories of feeling, you know, broken, defective. And then when you think about like the messages as that young children often get, you know, like how could, how, how could people not grow up feeling that way? Like there wasn't like, are, are, are we surprised? You know, when, when um, I, sometimes I, I, I don't think, I, I don't know if I've told this, this story of Brain Club, I tell the story like a lot because it's anyway, so content warning for, um, for, for school shame and emotional trauma so um a seven-year-old uh, that we know uh said that that you know their teacher hates them what, what do you mean like you're a sweet little love um well no you know i'm always told that i like you know i'm not doing the thing you know i i i can't stop talking you know i never stop moving i'm never doing the thing I'm not, i never I never do what i'm told i'm like well Anyway, it was just, when you really think about it, that's not, that's a systems problem. 
you know, so many times stories are told by like, you know, this person said this thing. We all have ways that, that make us feel, feel safe in environments that are dysregulating. You know, I can, you know, so a lot of the norms that, that, that really relate to having order in a state of chaos. So a lot of like the compliance-based brain rules are um, consequences of a dysfunctional system. It's a different spin on that story than I usually tell. Um, but, you know, I think that so many people, you know, it's like, like a little kid who may have an experience, you know, like, it's loud, I'm hot. And someone's like, it's not hot, it's not loud. And like decades of that, it's, you really lose, you can really lose touch with intuition. And it's, there's so much unlearning that goes into like reducing that brain body disconnect. Oh, thanks, Mia. Oh, I don't know that I can download to this. Um, it's not letting me download. Is there a web-based link, Mia? Hi, Gabe. Hello. Hi, yeah, go for it. I I didn't realize I was on mute. Um, so in, you know, there's the theme is about culture and like something that someone else had mentioned, you know, about, uh, or it was in the, the video, the hunter gatherer culture and stuff like that. And that was, I think my generation and, you know, post world war one or whatever, you know, the, the idea of the nuclear family that can, just survive all the things by themselves, you know, um, is I think a similar theme in kind of how society has designed education, you know, like a one size fits all box. And to me, I think the, the feeling of, of culture is, is, and a lot of what ABB is about is about bringing education to, to, you know, there's no one right way to teach a first grader, you know, like, um, or a third grader or, you know, someone who's in college and some of the things that I've seen, and I'm sure that you've seen with, um, with patients is <clears throat> when you come across like a, a school system that is like, oh, we've identified this thing and we, and we identify that their learning needs are different than others. I'm like, so ecstatic as opposed to um like them just getting like kind of like lost in the weeds and I think that's a, a shift that's happening in education I know that there's like a lot going into training teachers and things like that and I think that's a huge moving forward is going to be a huge part of <clears throat> uh like I suppose advocacy might not be the right word, but like promoting neurodivergent culture kind of starts with how we educate children. Right. And I think that, you know, even better than that would be, you know, universal design offering everything in flexible multimodal ways um, that, you know, for, for everyone, because I think what, what ends up, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's not of any fault of any individual. It's the way the system is currently set up in, in, uh, most, most, um, uh, public school systems is that in order to qualify for differentiation for the way your brain learns you have to fail and at least here here in Vermont that was pretty close to being improved um, and then a big setback um, in terms of um, 
legislation changing changing that about defining kind of the requirements to be able to access um, supports. Um, but that's 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 I think the next the next step would be to like to really accept that that neurodiversity and diversity of ways in which our brains learn is 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 to be expected. This is common, um, which is why universal design is best practice. Um, you know, I can say in my in 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 my medical education experience, there's there's one way to learn a lot of the things. Like, okay, so you you will you know if you're going to learn a procedure, you will you will see one, and and everybody can imitate a thing they see, and then you go do one. Like you could just see it and imitate it. Like that was that was um the default. That's not how my brain learns. I always felt like really, really bad all the time as a medical student. I had no idea about dyspraxia or you know that like one in ten people at least is is not going to be able to learn a motor skill that way. Um, reading the chat, uh, Emily says the the school system is waiting for kids to fail before stepping in is a common theme in Massachusetts. Yeah, I think I think I, th I think it's you know, and it, from a systems perspective, it's like well, um, how, how anyway, there's systems. Systems are hard, but I think like you know, surrounding surrounding people. Um, you know, with people who get it and you know, just like shifting that paradigm of, of there's no default brain. I think that alone, you know, goes somewhere. At least that's my hope. Well, I think what's cool about it too is that it trickles to other parts of your life. So if you learn it in a safe space, like all brains belong, like understanding the idea that everyone has access needs and you understand um, like it's a safe place to explore concepts and have words for things you never had words for. I think then when you're in other spaces in your life, like you said, you can either just exit if it doesn't feel congruent with what feels good to you or just know how to advocate for you or your child's access needs. Um, and, and so, you know, it sort of gives you that like protective bubble of being like, oh, I'm not alone. There's other people who are in this situation and feel the same way I do. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are new to thinking about neurodiversity and access, um, you know, like has, has, what, what, what's your experience been with, with like the, either the rewriting of old narratives or what Sarah said, just like the, the applying of, you know, one narrative to other worlds that you exist in. Mel, I have a thought. Go for it. Um, because I, uh, through this conversation, um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about, um, I'm constantly thinking about my relationship to my experience and, um, I think it's part of who I am. It's part of the work that I do. And, um, and I've been thinking a lot, uh, hold on, uh, uh, I've been thinking a lot about whether or not what I know or believe is true because it's attached to a world rule or a brain rule. And, um, and I'm a therapist and that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that kind of awareness 
is really powerful, but it's also um, unsettling. Um, but in my experience, those things that unsettle us are usually the things that teach us the most. So that's that's where I am, wading into a pool. Totally. So, you know, in many ways, I think that um, when one's professional training in a in a paradigm like is you know like you 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 train for so long in a paradigm and then to like see the mismatch between your experience and your training and then it's so hard um and so i think that you know in many in 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 you know, I think, I think Sierra and I, we are constantly like, there's, there's all kinds, I mean, like we, we've come a long way, I think, of unlearning a lot of our training, but like even, even it, like da daily, there's something like, it. you know, I don't know, is that a brain rule or overall? I don't know, but there's, there's a lot of brain rules. And mm -hmm. then, and also, oh, I don't know if this would be helpful to you, Matt, or anyone. Um, and so, by the way, that's like ABV jargon, like we made that those terms up. So, uh, you know, if you're new to this, um, a brain rule is like something you think is a universal life truth. It's like a cultural assumption or the way you were trained or the way you were raised or, you know, whatever. But it's not like an objective law of physics or anything. It's not a true world rule. Um, so, you know, something like um, uh, to be polite. I must make eye contact when someone's talking. Like that is a brain rule. That is not a world rule. But like, you know, how many times really like, kids told that? Where it's in the in the in if, if if truly viewed through a cultural paradigm, like if if someone you know has a you know a, a a different type of culture for whom eye contact is not the norm, like you would never be like you know shamed for not doing the thing. Anyway, it's just it's this, this is very similar. Um, but anyway, um, I think that Matt, to your point about like brain rules and world rules, just because you distinguish something as a brain rule, that doesn't mean you have to give it up. We all have brain rules. And the purpose of a brain rule is to keep you safe. And so if your brain rule is working for you, you can keep it. You can know something's a brain rule and and still keep it if it serves you and if it doesn't serve you you might choose to make the new brain rule or let it go or something but like i think that um you know your 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 paradigm of like you know becoming more familiar with your experience i think like maybe it'll feel like a little bit less unsettling not that you're trying to be unsettled but you know less unsettling if you can remind yourself you don't have to give up your brain rules <laughs> hi hi mia go ahead yes. I think a lot of us, like, who who think, like, a lot of other people make out that brain, that our brain rules don't keep, don't, um, don't work for us, like, ba but basically, like, I think what I always like to, to make clear was that it wasn't my brain rules that were harming me. It was the people who were who were excluding me because of my brain rules. And it's like right, it was their brain the, rules. Yeah. That's what it, that is that is much more common. I don't think our brain rules hurt us. I think our our brain rules keep us safe. I think that other people's brain rules very commonly hurt other people and it sounds like that was your experience yeah and it's like a lot of people would tell me to take uh therapy a content warning sorry a lot of people would tell me to take therapy so i could overcome my brain rules but actually it wasn't my brain rules that were the problem it was the it was their sort of yeah it was theirs. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's so common, right? So in a, in a, in a traditional, I don't want to say traditional, in, in a lot of Matt, I'm um, maybe Matt can help me with my language in a lot of mental health um, or like the default mental health paradigm. It's to say that, you know, for, for in all cases, it's your thoughts that, 
result in your emotional experience when mm. when you know there's so much more that goes into that it's the you know it's 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 sensory processing it's it it's vibe it's everything um amy i can for sure show you how to raise your hand but you also don't need to do the zoom raise hand you could just raise your hand but if you wanted to use the zoom raise hand which i never do but if you wanted to your menu might say reactions at the bottom and then raise hand is a choice on that menu, but you never have to use that button. You could, you can do what you did, which is to type in the chat. You're trying to raise your hand. There you go, you I'm, raised your hand. I'm not very good. I don't know if I'm unmuted. Okay, I think I am. Um, I'm not very good at the chat, um, reading it or, um, which is hard to admit, but, or typing in it, but, um, I wanted to just say one thing when you were asking new people, you know, people who are new to um, identifying as autistic or or neurodivergent. Um, I had an interesting thing. I'm trying to access a medical um, procedure and my therapist wrote out a response based on a conversation. So I had, so then I was able to bring that to Sierra who then helped me with the prompt of going to the doctor so I was like okay I had these two prompts that were like so helpful and um what was interesting was uh as I was asking my questions um I got the the answers I really wanted but I kept getting laughed at but what was so cool was because I had the prompt of this support from you know like my therapist is neurodivergent and Sierra who's like helping me navigate how much to share you know um to access the service I just didn't see it as a problem with me. I just, it was like, there was just a question of like, I wonder what's funny. Um, but I was like, oh, maybe there's just like nervousness of someone not being used to someone acts, you know, accessing their needs or getting prepared of having an expectation of what I should expect in the consult. And then I went to, then I had to call the insurance company um, to figure out like, will I, will this be covered? And that's when I didn't have a prompt for that. <laughs> it was like, everything went downhill for me. And it was like, I can't even get this. And I don't even know how. And, you know, I was like, went from like excited to like, so then I just brought it back to my therapist today and they were like, oh, this is how you can navigate that. And I realized like having this community, of just like having a prompt to to begin with can then help understand the difference between like say how we can access our needs here translate the difference between someone who wants to ac you know help us access our needs or not and then go oh maybe i need to figure out an insurance company who actually wants to help me and give my money to those companies and so that's sort of like my new idea of like kind of reframing where I actually even put my resource of who actually wants to help me, whether that's a restaurant or, you know, a school or anything like that is like, we get to, to say where we put our energy um, is kind of what is coming out of this conversation for me. I love that because when you, when you, first off, I'm so proud of you and I'm so profoundly disappointed that you were laughed at for asserting your access needs. And I'm so proud of you for like about like how far you've come in your journey in such a short time, really, to be able to like the moment that you can blame the environment instead of blaming yourself like that is that's a game changer. But um, it's sort of like because I and, have these two people. Um, I, I, Sorry. No, sorry. I was just going to say, it's just, I think it was partly because I ha I feel bolstered by the community, right? So it's like, I hear other people's experience or I have like, I have Sierra's um, voice in my head that's saying, it's okay to say, I have, you know, you don't may not have to say, oh, I'm autistic if you don't feel comfortable or safe, but you could say you have sensory processing or you're, you're, you, you know, are really sensitive. And so just like reframing that. And so to have that voice in my head really helps me navigate what's on the other side of whether, you know, I'm safe or not.
so it's sort of like you bring the you bring like Mel and you bring Sierra and you bring you know bring all these little people with you you know that's amazing oh that warms my soul right so like the whole point of community right like like connected to other people so not only you know I think your story is also I think a, a an incredible model for like the, the whole culture of interdependence thing like whenever I, I forget who I was telling this to earlier today I was like most of the time if I have like you know a stressful situation coming up or like I have a conflict I have to navigate I definitely reach out to other people to like give me ideas for what to say like people write my emails for me a lot like I mean this is just that's that that that's that's okay um, reading the chat, yeah, um, uh, Mia saying, I, I, I've blamed my environment since being a child, but lots of people told me I wouldn't progress if I, quote, didn't take responsibility, right? So, you know, there's that, 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 that's a brain rule, someone else's brain rule. You know, you, it's, it's so, it's so hard. It's so hard when you, when you get these messages and so many, so many people get these messages. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 and I think there's also, you know, uh, culturally shared brain rules um, are the ones that are most difficult, I think, to distinguish from world rules, right? Because um, lots of people say lots of stuff. And when you repeat something that someone else has said, you like sometimes don't even question it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah and you know what you, your your next comment about um power you know I, I i i talk a lot about power with my five-year-old because i think it's really important sometimes the only you know the only time the the only concept of power is power over and people seek out power over other people um but but that's not the only power uh, so Luna's like, what do you mean? As you know, anyway, so, uh, so, so, you know, like the power of connection, the power of community, right? Like, um, that's why we watch a lot of My Little Pony, the magic of, of friendship and connection, um, where like the, the, the people who are seeking power over others, they, 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 they don't prosper. Um, and, you know, or, or they prosper in like the very short term. And it's hard because in real life, um, short term, medium term, long term, it's not, it's, it's, it's the damage of short term power over is so, can be so damaging and so traumatic. And I think that. I'm hoping, hoping that we see is that, you know, the, 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 the power of connection can, can facilitate healing. Yeah, so, I, totally, I was going to say, I totally agree with Travis. It's like, they, they don't, they always make out that the problem is our reaction to to our environment instead of the environment like oh if you were a stronger person you wouldn't let it affect you right 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 and it's um it's as opposed to framing strength around asserting your access needs strength around you know self-awareness um, when really, you know, a, 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 a lot of times we talk about that, you know, when, when, uh, so for so many diagnoses, you know, in particular autism, right, is that these are autistic stress behaviors listed in the DSM. Um, the idea being that you're, you're not going to see these these particular described behaviors until someone is profoundly dysregulated. And a lot of people are because of the environment and that's entirely missing. So with that, 
7.07 will wrap us up. I really appreciate everyone being here and participating in all the many ways that you've participated tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next week. I forget what next week is. What's next week? Anybody know? The eighth. Oh. Uh, I can't remember what the topic is. No, I, I just saw the- uh, Theme and internalized oh, ableism. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, I will see you um, for- um, oh. Sorry, do your, do your clocks go back next this oh, week? Oh, I never, I, I so, so like, this is the first year I think I probably feel comfortable um, necessarily naming this. I never have any idea when the clocks go back. I always reverse the direction. I have like my memorized fall behind, spring ahead or something. So I guess we're Good. going back. So uh, daylight savings, is that is that this weekend? Yeah. Uh, but oh, yeah, it is. It yeah. is. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, That's because, good information. Yeah, because to, today it's actually an hour earlier for me because my clocks went back uh, just the weekend just gone. So. so, and then we go back next weekend and then you it continues to be the midnight time for you again so for this yeah, one for this yes. one week well i'm glad you could i'm glad you could make it i'm sorry it becomes midnight again for you next week yeah all right thanks everybody bye, bye.